Good morning, everyone. And, and first of all, I want to say um, thank you very much to the conference organizers for this great opportunity uh, to be here speaking to you today. And, and it's my first time in Wageningen, um, so, you know, it, which is a real honor uh, being a plant breeder, geneticist, and, and uh, with the history here uh, in the, the Netherlands around plant breeding. Uh, and also an honor to be speaking to you today as leading experts in phenotyping and physiology uh, as a plant breeder. Uh, and so I thought to, to start my talk with something uh, quite familiar, hopefully to many of you, a Van Gogh uh, uh, impression of a wheat field being harvested um, is pretty cool. And I must say that you uh, phenotypers are a result of a, uh, of a long history of phenotyping and descendants perhaps of farmers even thousands of years ago who were the original phenotypers. Uh, they were phenotyping plants essentially because they kept the most productive uh, seeds and tubers to grow the next season. Uh, of course phenotyping back then was important to develop our crops that we have today that have contributed to this but also phenotyping has become even more important as we look forward to, to improving our crops for the future. And so plant breeding, um, you know, originally the farmer, now modern plant breeding, which has intensified over the last 100 or 200 years, has really delivered these highly productive crops that we have on farm um, that support billions of people on this planet. So it's pretty amazing, plant breeding, really. Uh, however, um, we have some challenges ahead. So here's the global uh, traje uh, trajectory of, of global wheat yield. It's pretty much the same situation for any crop. Uh, here's the steady increase that we're on, thanks to plant breeding and, and phenotyping technologies. Uh, this is where we could end up. So if we stop plant breeding tomorrow and fall victim to climate change and rapidly evolving pests and diseases, our productivity is going to decline. This is where we need to be uh, in order to feed 10 billion people by 2050. Uh, we need to bring together advances in on-farm management systems and, and new breeding technologies to improve the efficiency of plant breeding uh, progress uh, in order to develop these high yielding crops. But it's not just about creating high yielding crops, right, for the future. It's about improving the sustainability of these crops, which is a real challenge. Um, uh, so, you know, and I think um, there's a growing pressure to reduce the, the environmental footprint of farming in general. Uh, and even you know, recently we've seen the protests uh, here in the Netherlands from farmers uh, around the uh, reduction in allocation of nitrogen fertilizers uh, going forward into the future. So this is really uh, a big challenge. And if we think about the current breeding programs, or at least the historic breeding programs, because um, things are shifting quickly, uh, this might have been the prioritization for traits in the breeding program. So yield was king, quality was queen, uh, because you've got to sell your product to a market, right? And, and these other farmer traits, I like to call them, which are actually sustainability traits. So these are traits that are reducing the inputs on farm. Uh, so traits like early vigor for weed competition to reduce uh, herbicide sprays, drought adaptation for, for climate, um, climate, ad uh, climate resilience, nitrogen use efficiency to reduce the fertilizer inputs. Now what this is resulting is in varieties that have generally lower sustainability metrics. So you can see this is essentially in, really, uh, causing uh, higher emissions pre-farm gate and on farm. So we can start to think about rearranging or reprioritizing these different traits in a breeding program. And it's important that we start today because if we think about 2030, so the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals, that's just a few years away. 2050 is really just a few breeding cycles. So we have to start now and think about the, the value proposition for the future for our farmers, uh, about re reducing these input costs. And I would argue that sustainability is profitability. This is the same thing for the future. Uh, now, like I said, plant breeding works. It's an iterative process, uh, but it, that's, it's time consuming. So every breeding cycle, uh, you know, to develop a new, new crop variety could take any, anywhere between, you know, eight to 15 years, depending on the crop and the breeding program. So how do we start to develop these more sustainable and profitable crops faster is the really big question. 
So, from a plant breeding perspective, um, I present two paths we can take. Uh, we can do a better job at harnessing the natural allelic variation in our breeding programs uh, and in the gene bank, of course, with, with this amazing genetic diversity that we have access to. Or we can use the latest genome engineering approaches to engineer new trait variation in our modern crops directly. Now, I, I say that we need both. We need both paths and we need all the tools in the shed and technologies in order to develop these crops in record time uh, if we're going to actually do this. So today I wanted to talk through uh, a few case studies and show um, how we're using different technologies to accelerate uh, these traits, uh, sustainability traits, many of which are old farmer traits. We've got to keep in mind. So the first one is on uh, harnessing natural alle allelic variation to improve disease resistance. And so, you know, like I said, we've got this amazing diversity in gene banks that includes historical breeding lines, land races, wild relatives, and these materials harbour a wealth of new resistance factors that we can start to uh, transfer into our modern varieties uh, and give them to the farmer. Now, and when we do that, what we're talking about is a reduction in fungicide sprays, emissions on farm, enhanced sustainability. Now, the journey from gene bank to farm is a long one. Uh, each of these phases can take 10 years, so pre-breeding and research, and then breeding 10 years. So there's a lot, a lot involved here to track down which accessions carry the resistances, uh, map them, identify markers, transfer them into elite materials, and then give them to a breeder to make additional crosses. And look, look, let's face it, sometimes it never even reaches the farm. And so uh, we've got to speed up this process if we're going to tap into this allelic variation. And so this brings me to speed breeding technology, which I've spent the last 10 years, uh, a lot of my time, uh, developing protocols for a whole range of species, working with breeding programs and companies all around the world to set up facilities for speed breeding at a massive scale. So growing hundreds of thousands of plants at one time, transforming our breeding programs uh, around the world. And you can see how fast they grow in that time lapse, speed breeding versus normal conditions. And this is just a matter of optimizing the environmental conditions to promote early flowering and achieve rapid generation advance. Um, and so, you know, this can be done uh, for any species. So, you know, we're talking about growing up to four to six generations a year for most of our species. And, and I have projects on developing speed breeding protocols for bananas. You know, uh, all sorts of species. You, do, you, you can do this for any species. It's just a matter of optimizing the conditions. And I'd say the big ones are temperature, photo period, and then we can go after these other elements like light quality, nutrient delivery, in, in terms of further optimization. It's really interesting actually how uh, species specific uh, the, the interaction is with specific uh, light uh, wavelengths. So some uh, bands will induce early flowering in some species, not others. Uh, some will uh, suppress elongation so we can pack more plants in to a facility, for example. And so there's been a lot of barriers to overcome with these species, overcoming dormancy, you know, for rapid generation advance, overcoming vernalization. And I think I wanted to present this because actually it's exciting to be here in Europe uh, for the first time for three, for three years. Uh, for, for, because of COVID, of course. Um, and I know how important winter wheat and winter barley is here in Europe. And, and so I thought to show this, this recent advance, because this enables us to overcome this vernalization barrier for breeding. So now we can rapidly cycle winter wheat and winter barley as fast as spring wheat and spring barley. There's no more limitations. So we can grow up to five or six generations a year. How do we do this? We actually put the seeds on the surface of the soil I know it sounds crazy. Uh, during the vernalization process, they get early exposure to light. Uh, we don't fully understand the mechanism, but it works. Uh, and uh, we use elevated temperatures to satisfy the vern and thermal time requirements. So when we pull them out, they flower even faster. That's pretty cool. So if speed breeding has lots of applications. Um, it also has applications for phenotyping some simple traits during the speed breeding process. And, and we've been working with commercial breeders uh, on this uh, for some time. Uh, and it actually is quite effective when we think about these disease traits. 
uh, and screening large segregating populations. So when we do the screening, we end up with really enriched inbred lines in terms of enrichment of the alleles driving disease resistance when they go into the field for evaluation. And so here you can see just an overview of some of the uh, methodologies that we've developed and adapted. So these are disease screens that already existed and pathologists already developed in a regular glass house, but we just adapted them for use in a speed breeding environment. And I'll walk you through uh, a case study for yellow spot resistance or tan spot resistance that was done by Eric in his PhD. Uh, so just to provide a bit of an overview of the general approach that we take, um, here's the traditional field screening uh, in, the, in, the, in the field for disease, setting up specialised disease nurseries you know, to phenotype resistance. And look, this is the preferred method, to be honest, but you can only do it once a year, and some years they fail because it's drought, a drought year. So we thought there's some advantages in taking this into a controlled environment to do this all year round. And so here you can see the general approach we accelerate plant development for the first three or four weeks to get adult plants because we're interested in adult plant resistance, which tend to be more durable than the typical seedling resistance. Um, so we get adult plants quickly, we infect them with our favourite pathogen uh, using standard uh, protocols, uh, and after that incubation period they return back to the speed breeding system and we can actually uh, turn the lights down. So, so we actually change the lighting conditions to 12 hours which favour pathogen development, and that enhances our ability to differentiate resistant and susceptible genotypes. Um, and then 12, 10 or 14 days later, depending on the disease, we just pull out the, the susceptible plants. And so you can do cycles of this through your breeding program. We can also select the resistant plants, chop them back, um, this is a cool thing about grasses, chop them back and transplant them, add a bit of nutrient, lower the night temperature and they'll re-tiller and we can make crosses on those really valuable plants as well, depending on what the breeding goal is. So Eric uh, implemented this approach for tan spot and he found some really rare QTLs uh, for tan spot resistance in uh, Vavilov wheat land races from Pakistan. And so he, he, he used this technique to rapidly back cross them, uh, back cross four derived lines he created uh, in 18 months. And he backcrossed these resistances into uh, the five varieties on your screen. These were, the, 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 at that time, the varieties that farmers grew all around the country, but they lacked resistance. They were susceptible. So it's a big problem, this tan spot disease. And so after the 18 months of developing these lines and transferring these genes from the, basically a gene bank accession, uh, pretty wild materials. And you can see here, uh, we, we took it to the field to validate the resistance. And here's the field trial in our yellow spot nursery next door, uh, a, a picture from our drone. And so we're still analysing a lot of the data from this trial. We actually got a, a crazy amount of UAV data, which is actually really cool because you can start to quantify um, the effect of these genes are, are protecting the canopy as well under these disease conditions. And you can see the original variety there on your left, Suntop, compared to one of our introgression lines, which is essentially Suntop plus the new adult plant resistance gene from that Pakistani land race. And so we've gone from gene bank to, to field in, in three years into an equivalent elite variety. So really cool, opening up a whole new gene pool that we can tap into for a whole range of traits. Case study two I'm going to talk about is engineering routes to improve water and nutrient uptake. So this is where we're going to talk about CRISPR. And that's because uh, I'd say even though plant breeding has been very, very effective, uh, perhaps when it comes to underground traits, uh, we might have actually thrown away some really useful uh, trait variation because of this intensive selection for above ground traits and optimization in terms of plant height, flowering time, and so potentially uh, we might need new trait variation underground to adapt our crops to future farming systems. So what are we talking about? We're talking about root length for drought adaptation, root architectural traits, uh, even, um, even root hairs for better uptake of nutrient as well if we're going to make these crops more nutrient use efficient. Uh, so, what do we do? Do we take the land races and back cross them like our yellow spot study? Or can we use genome engineering? Uh, and so uh, on this approach, we're using editing and we're, we're taking lessons from uh, the amazing research that's been done in our model plant species. So Metacargo, Arabidopsis, these are plants that have small genomes and the pathways are really well defined. 
So we can, we can actually directly target some of these genes in our crop species, which have large, complex genomes, and see whether these also translate. Because if they do, uh, we can save a lot of time. And so this is our general approach in terms of the methodology or pipeline for our genome editing, going from you know, speed breeding environment, the embryos go through, transform using your CRISPR-Cas9 system and back to the speed breeding system. So we're integrating these tools all the time. Uh, and while I'm going to show you some results for Golden Promise, uh, we've now got this system working really nicely for a bunch of uh, elite barley varieties as well, which is really important. So we developed a whole bunch of plants that are edited for root genes, and then we quickly found ourselves having a, a pretty big problem, phenotyping. Uh, and that's because these plants are, are deemed GMO when they're first generated, and we have to prove that they're non-GM, but that takes time and sequencing, uh, and we wanted to phenotype the roots. And so, uh, yeah, these are contained to a quarant you know, quarantine glasshouse, essentially. And so we, well, this is why we developed this low-cost Rhizobox uh, phenotyping system that Yichin presented earlier in the week. Yes, it's definitely cheap, uh, but it's, I'd say it's very, very effective at measuring the traits that we want to measure in terms of root distribution. So we set up these chambers in rows and, and have a, a nice water table at the bottom, uh, which enables us to, to phenotype this root distribution. So just to show you some results, um, uh, here you can see one of the barley plants that we've edited uh, for one of the root genes uh, from, from Arabidopsis. And you can see the blue angle there is the actual phenotype of uh, Golden Promise roots. So it's, Golden Promise has a pretty wide root system. Uh, and, and we've actually effectively made this a narrower root angle through our gene editing approach. So if we have a look at the Rhizobox system, this is what it looks like in comparison to Golden Promise. So gene knockout uh, for gene one. Um, I'm not going to talk about the, the specific genes today uh, because the PhD students have just generated these results. So, um, but hopefully it gives you an idea of the power of this approach that we're taking. First of all, you'll notice that that root angle phenotype is maintained throughout the whole root system. That's pretty cool. Uh, such a dramatic change. And, and you'll see, however, that the roots are actually shorter uh, which, which presents a problem, right? So if we want to make a deep, cheap, steep, cheap, deep roots, then we actually need to couple this mechanism with root elongation factors. So the challenge doesn't stop here. Uh, this is just scratching the surface, literally. Um, and here you can see a second gene that we've edited. This is part of Zach's work. Uh, and you'll see the shoot here is actually responding to gravity, so it's growing upwards. But look at the roots. This root is growing upwards as well. So this is a root-specific gravitropic response that we've actually knocked out in the, in the, in the plant. Uh, and when we look at the, the rhizobox system, we get more roots in that upper layer. So they don't know where they're going. They're just going all over the place. Uh, so you can see we can start to change the direction of root growth in both directions, but we have lots of challenges, including when it comes to shoot trade-offs. So when we edit a root gene, Unfortunately, most of these genes are coming with shoot trade-offs. In an ideal situation is we would like to edit the root genes without that shoot effect. And you can see here uh, gene one, which was providing this narrow root growth, uh, has this re reduction in tillering, and at maturity it has a shorter plant height as well. Um, so which might actually be an advantageous trait combination in some dry environments in Australia, but in some other uh, high yielding environments, we actually want to maintain this high tillering capacity. So this, this uh, brings me to our collaboration with uh, Dr. Peter Crisp, and, and he's an expert in epigenetics, and uh, we're taking this approach to try to decouple uh, these trait relationships. So uh, looking at using our gene knockout approach, but targeting these regulatory regions around the gene. So they can be either upstream or downstream, uh, cis regulatory elements or promoter regions uh, of, the, of the actual gene as well. So theoretically, um, coming up with different trait combinations or even fine-tuning trait expression could be possible uh, through this approach. That's because extreme phenotypes are not always advantageous. Uh, it's a non-linear response for a lot of these physiological traits, and there's a sweet spot where we want to be. Uh, so I think really exciting um, sort of space uh, because a lot of, some research has shown in tomato, for example, the approach can be quite effective. So at the end of the day, what are we talking about? We're talking about coming up with different root, shoot, trait combinations, providing an arsenal of, 
of genetic uh, tools and insight for breeders to be able to come up with these combinations for different production systems. Uh, and, you know, in Australia, it's very, very different production systems where we grow these crops. It's extremely diverse, different soil types, weather conditions, etc. Case study three. Now I want to talk about weed competitiveness. So this is all about reducing herbicide uh, on, on farm. Uh, and, and, and improving the, the vigour of the variety, but you'll see there's not just there's more to it than just vigour. So we first started off this work uh, with Cameron uh, Van Lane uh, and his master's project quite a few years ago, and uh, we, he started measuring the lengths of, of, of the first and second leaf um, of these plants in the field, so literally crawling along the ground with a ruler measuring the, the length of these leaves, and that's because some uh, you know, really nice work done in wheat by Greg Rebetsky and others have shown that the length of this second leaf could be a good predictor of early vigour for breeding programs. Um, and so here's some of the results for the length of the second leaf. You can see for commercial varieties, you'll see Latrobe is very short, and that translates to really uh, slow ground cover or poor ground cover at that early crop growth stage. Uh, whereas Commander, uh, and similar to these other three varieties, much better uh, ground coverage and, and theoretically uh, competitiveness. So the next step, now that we actually characterised early vigour uh, in some of these varieties, was to do uh, some weed competition studies. And we did these trials over two years, and instead of using real weeds, it was actually easier to use oats instead. Um, uh, and so we could actually measure the oat seed that's produced in each of these different plots. So here's some of the results, and you'll see um, that the weed seed that's produced in Latrobe is very high. So Latrobe wasn't very effective at, at competing against these weed, spe the weed species, which were oats. Um, and so here you can see the other three varieties that had higher early vigour. And, and while they reduce the weed seed, they, there's this huge variation among the varieties. So it said to us that, yes, early vigour is probably important, but it's probably not the only trait that we need to start to couple together to get improved weed com uh, competitiveness down to a really low level, uh, like Westminster, for example. So this, I had some nice conversations with breeders around early vigour and weed competition, and um, they first basically came, came back to me and said, oh, well, what if these genes are the same as, as the flowering genes? because then we're not going to be able to change early vigour at all because flowering time is really critical for drought adaptation and avoidance of frost. Uh, so that's really, that could be quite problematic. So, so this sort of set us off on a path to understand the genetics of early vigour in barley. Um, and so we developed a nested association mapping population uh, for barley uh, through our speed breeding system. Uh, and we evaluated it uh, in, in five different environments. Uh, you can see here in Australia across two years. Um, and so we have a bit of a range of environment types, so low yielding environment, about two and a half tonnes to about five tonnes on average in, some, in another site. And you'll see the genetic correlations up here for, across the five sites. Uh, it's pretty typical that the sites uh, within a year are highly correlated, uh, and, and we have a poor correlation across seasons. We have this huge seasonal variation in Australia, and that really reinforces the need to be phenotyping these traits across multiple years and environments. So Cameron, uh, at the, back then we, we were using this green seeker, which is pretty old school now, and it's exhausting to be honest, carrying this thing, it's super heavy with the battery pack and a harness, walking thousands and thousands of plots. Um, uh, and look at the time, it was better than the visual assessment that breeders were using to score vigour. Uh, but now we have our UAV platform, which can capture this trait much more precisely at that whole plot level. Um, Cameron also scored flowering at all of these sites as well. And so through our MET analysis with Hannah Robinson, we performed a nice GWAS. Um, uh, where he, she was working together with our uh, master's student, Miguel, and I'll show you some of the results from our GWAS study, which is pretty interesting. First of all, this plot's pretty hectic, so I'll explain what's going on over here. This is a circular Manhattan plot. Um, so we have the chromosomes around the outside, seven chromosomes of barley, and the inner circle you can see here, the inner ring, is showing you the GWAS results for early vigour, the first trait. Now you'll see lots of little uh, red dots here, which indicate the significant haploblocks associated with early vigour. No surprisingly, there's quite a few. It's a complex trait. Now, what I'll do is I'll reveal the outer ring, which actually includes the days to end thesis association. So these are haploblocks associated with flowering. Um, and I'll, I'll run through some of the key results here. So 
we have four haploblocks associated with both traits, flowering and early vigor. So uh, maybe not so promising, but really cool stuff. We have seven haploblocks associated with only early vigor and, seven, and six haploblocks associated with days of flowering. So this, these haploblocks that are independent give us the flexibility and, op and, and opportunity to start tailoring these uh, early vigor traits in the context of different flowering times, which I think is pretty, pretty promising. Of course, if you remember back to the, my weed competition uh, slides, I, I talked about the other factors driving canopy development. And we thought that you're using our UAV platform now, this presents an opportunity for us to start modeling this, this data more dynamically. So here's an overview of the UAV phenotyping platform. Uh, thanks to Scott Chapman at UQ, who's developed this. Essentially, it's a Matrice 300 drone. Uh, pretty cool. I think it's got a bit of a spider face going on there. Uh, uh, drones are awesome. Uh, and and multi-spectral camera. This is an Ultim sensor that uh, Yichen talked about uh, uh, with, the, with the five bands and uh, thermal that we're capturing. So just producing a crazy amount of data. And look, to be honest, why I like drones from a breeding perspective is that we can phenotype larger populations uh, more accurately for the traits that we're already phenotyping on, on the ground. So uh, with a 20 minute flight, we can capture thousands of plots and traits now. Uh, but it's all also enabling us to evaluate and explore traits that the human eye can't see, like, like canopy temperature. So, so really cool um, and, and great opportunities for plant breeding, I think. So here's some of the team I get to work with uh, back at UQ and some of the early career researchers and, uh, who are using the drone platform. Some of them are here today at the conference. So uh, Yichin spoke earlier in the week. Uh, Shanice is going to talk about her mung bean phenotyping um, later this morning. And Dan Smith uh, has a poster here on radiation use efficiency. Uh, so, so please uh, say hello to them if you see them around. So the, what do we do with all this data? Uh, so we have this longitudinal data that we can start to model. And we're actually using this approach that's been developed by Fred Vernuick's team here in Wageningen, which I think is a pretty robust approach to, to dealing with this. So here you'll see the raw Asavi um, values at different time points. So this is, an, this is our experiment. And here's our seven time points uh, going this way. Once we do that spatial adjustment, uh, for where, we, where we fit genotype, row, and column as uh, random effects, you can see that we're starting to pull out this variation here at the top of the trial. Uh, so really important that we start to, uh, you know, input really, really accurate phenotypes uh, into this modeling before we get started. So, and here's our growth curve of adjusted Asavi over time. Um, you can see the, the, the variation here as we get uh, further into crop development. Uh, and here's our seven flights. And a really cool thing is that uh, around this four, flight four, we, when we look at the second derivative of the, the growth curve rate, we start to see crossover uh, among genotypes. Um, so there's different factors, or genetic factors potentially, driving the rate of growth here at the early vigor phase compared to up here, which relates back to the tillering and architectural uh, phases coming in. So we started to treat these things separately in our modeling and pulling out these different traits from the growth curve. Um, so here we go, another circular Manhattan, pretty crazy this time because we don't have two traits anymore, we've got five. So working our way outwards, um, we have rate from time point one to four as the inner circle, rate from time point four to seven. So we, we've got these different um, uh, ends of the curve that we're looking at, uh, area under the curve growth rate, area under the curve growth curve, and max growth rate. So I'll just highlight some of the really interesting stuff here. So here we have a QTL region that's actually picking up the same region uh, as our static uh, QTLs that I reported earlier using our NDVI uh, at single time point. So the dynamic modeling is identifying the same QTL. However, this is the really cool stuff, when we start to tease out and tease apart these different rates of the growth curve, we, we, they're actually being driven by different genetic factors. So here you can see uh, a, a haploblock associated with the rate of change in early growth only, whereas this haploblock is associated with the rate of change late in growth. So we can start to couple these different haploblocks together in different combinations to, to, to create different varieties with different configurations. So uh, here you can see the different sort of canopy development um, sort of uh, models, 
and we can start to deploy these into different uh, varieties for different regions. Now, the real challenge here, of course, is uh, balancing the weed competitiveness with water supply and demand for these different production systems, because high vigour could be good for weed competition, but it's also going to result in higher water use early in the season, which could have consequences later uh, in the season for a dry environment. So the last phase of my talk is really around how do we bring all this, these traits together from a breeding perspective, and, and how do we do it quickly? Um, so, and what I'd like to point out first is, is because we have all these traits and genes, essentially, it presents a big challenge. It's a gene number problem, essentially, for breeders. And, and so breeders often don't think of genes, they think of chromosomal blocks. Or, uh, so that's why we have a big Lego mountain here of all the different blocks that could be available to a plant breeder to assemble into the ultimate uh, plant variety. Essentially, this is what they're doing. Um, so if we consider this problem, we might have 10 blocks or 10 genes for sustainability traits, perhaps some of, the, of those that I presented today. We might have 10 genes for yield component traits or performance that we, wanna, that we must have to couple into a new variety. And likewise for quality traits. So altogether we have 30 blocks or 30 genes. Now, if we want to create our ultimate sustainable wheat variety, um, and if all 30 blocks or genes come from 30 different plants, that's more than one billion possible ways that the lines could be crossed to get to that end product. Um, so how do we navigate that uh, and from a breeding perspective? This is a pretty big challenge. And let's face it, there's a lot more than 30 genes or blocks we want to couple together. Uh, so this, this brings me to the new um, AI-guided breeding approach that we've developed at UQ, thanks to uh, uh, Professor Ben Hayes, uh, one of the co-inventors of genomic prediction. Um, and you can see what we're doing is we're tapping into this massive amount of data of phenomic and genomic data and running our AI genetic algorithm across this. It's, it's a search algorithm that identifies the parents that maximise the blocks of interest for your traits in the set that you're crossing, which is really cool. I've got an example to show. But essentially, a key part of this and what we put into that algorithm is the phenotypes that are driving uh, the, the, the value of these chromosomal blocks for our traits. So that's where the phenotyping is so critical to have accurate phenotypes because this is useless. If you feed in rubbish, you're going to get rubbish out. Um, and so in silico, we can assemble uh, the ultimate variety. Right? Then we can go and actually create it. And I'll talk about how we do that. So just to give an example of how this is working. So we have a, new, we have a, a GRDC project uh, that's been going for a couple of years in Australia focused on disease resistance. So three diseases here really critical for, for, for Australian farmers. Uh, we're tapping into the Australian gene bank, so 3,000 barley accessions. We've genotyped with SNP markers, and we've phenotyped those accessions all around the country, working with pathologists for all these diseases and different races. And then we feed this information into the AI. And just to give an example for two of the traits, so here's a spot form net blotch, net form net blotch on this axis. Nine is susceptible in both cases, and here's the distribution of all the phenotypes in the population, the grey dots. Now, You'll see the green dots here are the parents that the AI algorithm have actually picked out. Now, you'll notice that some of these green dots are quite susceptible to both diseases. So to the naked eye, the plant breeder would never pick those accessions. But the AI algorithm has revealed uh, blocks that are hidden in the genome for resistance. And when reshuffled through breeding, actually leads to this purple progeny, a dramatic shift in resistance to both diseases. This is the power of bringing that big data together and, and, and using these sort of algorithms to pull out this sort of information to support breeding. So how do we create the ultimate stack uh, quickly? That's where speed breeding comes in. Uh, see, I told you, it's important. Um, and, and so, you know, we can make these crosses all year round, uh, four to six cycles of crosses a year. So that's how we actually do it. If you're interested in uh, some of this block stacking approach, you can check out um, um, this paper we published late last year in Nature with Rajiv Varshney. Uh, we took about 3,000 chickpea genomes and we created the, 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 the designer chickpea. Uh, we, we stacked all the blocks together for seed size and we showed that theoretically we could increase seed size up to fivefold uh, in chickpea, um, which may not be possible, but it shows the, the potential of this approach. So some take-home messages now. I uh, hope you can agree with me that plant breeding has delivered our highly productive crops, 
but we've got to become more efficient to meet future demand. And that's where phenotyping has a really key role to play. We have two paths, I reckon, to, to develop future crops with improved sustainability. One, we can do a better job at harnessing that natural allelic variation in our gene banks and breeding programs, uh, or we can use this genome engineering approach. But I think that we really need to have both of these approaches in parallel and bring them together. Our AI-guided breeding methods um, presents one framework. Uh, there's lots of ways to do this, but I think it's, a, it's a one strategy that we can bring all these traits together really quickly, but they rely on accurate phenotypes of thousands of lines. So that's where the phenotyping tech is so critical uh, to, to feed in really high quality data. And the last two points here are more like a call uh, to action. So this is a big challenges that we have. We need new analytical solutions to turn this big data into decisions. We can collect data, but what do we do with it from a breeding perspective? This is critical, and that's where the challenge is globally at the moment. This is the big challenge. This is like the hot stuff, I reckon, at the moment for, for our field. And we must expand knowledge of the trait value and trait combinations in different uh, production systems. So yeah, we can phenotype, we can come up with AI algorithms to put those traits together, but what, co what configurations do we really want uh, is the big challenge as well. So I want to uh, thank you all. I want to thank my team uh, back in Australia, some of the, the PhD students in my, in my group, um, the funding from the Australian government, uh, the GIDC, which is essentially uh, money from our farmers that's reinvested into R&D, uh, and IWIP for funding some of this research. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Steve, for this great talk. And I'm pretty sure they're going, raising hands. Oh, I can take a breather now. <laughs> Thank you, Lee, for an awesome talk. I was wondering, can you leverage your AI um, method for identifying not only the combination of the genes, but also whether a specific gene or a specific allele would have, would have an effect or the same effect in a specific genetic background. Because very often what we've got is that the gene is working in one variety, but in, in the other variety it doesn't have the same effect. Kind of identifying that beforehand would save a lot of time to a lot of people. Yeah, it's, it's, that's a really big challenge actually. Um, uh, we haven't, we haven't done that yet. Uh, it's something we're thinking about. And, and Ben, that's the great thing about working with Ben Hayes. He comes up with all sorts of crazy ideas. And, and one particular challenge we have where that was going to be very useful and we're working on is um, rust resistance genes. Um, you know, it, it, for a long time, actually for like maybe forever, 20 years, we were told that they're all additive. And it turns out they're not. Uh, uh, there's a lot of epistasis going on. So, so we really want to try to work out how to incorporate the epistasis into the AI algorithm uh, to start to bring those things together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe easier said than done. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for your talk. Um, I was curious about your speed breeding effort it's in itself. Uh, how do you balance the speed of the speed breeding versus the stress of the plants uh, during that process? And perhaps uh, this room here can help out in that stress level phenotyping um, as an opening. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, a long story short is that you, you, you do want uh, to stress them. <laughs> uh, you want to be mean to them. Uh, but there's a threshold. Uh, if, you, if you're too mean, they won't produce seed. So uh, there's, you know, in most of the refined speed breeding platforms we have, uh, we're talking about uh, nitrogen stress, um, water stress uh, to, you know, make them mature faster is really critical. If we think about speed breeding rice, for example, um, so stress is, a, is is your friend to push through these generations. But yeah, you're right. There's a fine line between too much stress. So getting that right is critical. And then when it comes to phenotyping. That's really important too, because that, that, you know, these plants are not growing in a normal environment. It's very, very different. And, and so you've got to be very, very careful when you start to integrate phenotyping into the system. Um, we found that the disease traits you know, work uh, pretty well uh, by dialing back the light and, and this sort of thing. But look, more complex traits, probably better off phenotyped in, in the field conditions, I would say. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, very nice presentation, Lee. Uh, congratulations. Uh, uh, I uh, really, um, I didn't see uh, the component of nutritional quality when it comes to, especially wheat, barley, 
and, and chickpea. Uh, I don't know if you uh, did um, some uh, studies related to nutritional quality. And then just I will go for the chickpea. You said that you can go from one, two, three, five uh, uh, times the seed size. I know that we did phenotype to magic population with more than 3,000 um, lines. And then we did um, found a very good correlation between the seed size and protein and uh, especially uh, zinc concentration. So I think it will be good if uh, some uh, studies on nutritional quality because now we are shifting from what we call food security to nutritional security and then we should combine both these nutritional yeah. quality um, issues. Yeah, you're right. You. Yeah, you're right. So, um, and I didn't talk about it in my talk. It's a very good point that these crops also need to be nutritious and, um, and, and probably tailored to a whole range of other food products as well. Um, and so that AI framework we're using uh, across a whole range of crops, including uh, quality traits as well, so, and very targeted, uh, can be very targeted around sensory traits for food products, uh, proteins uh, that, that could be you know, useful in particular food products. Uh, so yeah, fully, fully um, can be adapted to any of these uh, traits of interest. Yeah, especially with barley. So now, we are, like for molten barley, for example, it will be nice. So, yep. thank you. More, more questions? Ah. <laughs> thank you. Um, you mentioned it at the beginning. You know with sustainability, the issue of nitrogen. And, but you didn't actually tackle how breeders can deal with this, apart from maybe the root systems. You know, if, if you look at average EU yields of wheat in 2020 were almost six tonnes per hectare. And if you assume 2.5% nitrogen in the grain, that means you're taking off on average 150 kilos per hectare. And there's a lot of pressure on farmers in the EU to reduce their nitrogen input to 100 tonnes per hectare. So how do we deal with this mass balance problem and maintain nutrition? Yeah, yeah no, it's a, it's a good point. And um, like I, can't, I can't tell you all my secrets. Um, uh, but, but yeah, I think one of the strategies that probably needs to be incorporated here is uh, breeding for the farming system. So um, it's... It's, that's important when it comes to water at that ecosystem level. Like we can't be draining our aquifers by sucking up more water for a maize crop or, or for a wheat crop. We've got to be thinking about the rotation system and the farming system as well. And I think that's where some of these technologies can be quite useful to be breeding the legume species for the cereal species. So, um, you know, I think we've got to talk, think about this integration, and that's where the big advances can, can come from at that ecosystem level around nitrogen and water. Um, but, yeah, some pretty big challenges. <laughs> Again, easier said than done, yeah. Thanks for a very nice talk. Um, I was just wondering, uh, you, you, you showed how you can combine the natural variation part with gen genome, uh, gene editing approaches. Uh, while I completely agree with that, you mentioned that you were using, especially in your case, the gene editing tools for the below ground stuff because you argued that there's lower genetic diversity there. But do you have, because I'm actually thinking, because we, for a long time, we couldn't really phenotype them, so maybe there's much more diversity. Is this actually based on real evidence? Yeah, I, I think um, we've explored some traits in breeding populations and, and uh, for root architecture, uh, root angle, for example, um, there's actually quite surprisingly uh, a quite high variation. Um, uh, and that's not really surprising considering the diversity and environment types that the breeders have been breeding for, like really shallow soils, deep soils, different rainfall patterns. So they've actually indirectly uh, phenotyped and, 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 and selected for these traits. Um, so, this is, uh, so that's, I think, an opportunity to harness the traits better if we have a more targeted approach. But I think when it comes to root elongation and root hairs, that's where we probably have a narrower genetic variation for roots, uh, f f as an example. Um, we need to get a better understanding of which traits uh, we need to prioritise, I think. Yeah. So obviously I'm interested in the, in the root phenotypes which you have and the, the shoe trade-offs which you have there. So how much of this is actually structural and how much of this is sink source limitation? So did you check for photosynthesis changes in the, the ones which have a shoe trade-off? 
Um, uh, I don't think, I think some of the students have uh, collected some data, but we haven't sort of uh, looked through that yet. You know, typical collecting lots of data. <laughs> uh, no, it's a good question. Um, I think from some of the work that, you know, that's going on across crop species, you know, there seems to be these pleiotrophic effects for these master regulators above and below ground. Um, you know, I think that presents challenges and opportunities, but I think we've got to really try to, yeah, tease all this apart a lot better. Um, you know, for example, we, we found the, the vernalization one gene, which is a key regulator of flowering time, controlling root architecture. A lot of other species finding flowering genes controlling root architecture, I think, in, in common bean, uh, maybe even maize. Um, uh, but so decoupling these, these traits is, is, a, is a big challenge, I think. Yeah. Thanks very much again, Lee.